uh, we will begin very shortly. Uh, please stay with us. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good. Good evening, principal sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. sir. Yeah, all sir. Yeah, I request uh, I request you inform all the BPL student to join or NSA student. Okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, during the course of the program all the participants are requested to kindly turn off their videos and mute their audios except for the speakers to avoid any kind of disruption kindly cooperate
a very good evening to all the participants uh, in this first day of the three day international webinar on climate change human rights and literature organized by the department of english and iqs shiva bharati mahavidyalay kapgari jhargram west bengal in collaboration with the department of english uh, government general degree college mohanpur poshchim medipur west bengal india on behalf of the department of english i rick shorkar welcome you all now the response that you have received as far as this webinar is concerned has been thoroughly overwhelming we have received many papers uh, both from india and outside and it's truly amazing and at the same time we also have a host of speakers who will be speaking on the interconnected network relationship between climate change literature and human rights and uh, before we begin uh, let me take this opportunity first of all to express uh, my gratitude to mr babulal mahato sdo administrator uh, dr Pro professor dr dev prashad shaw who is the uh, chief patron and the principal of shri bharati mahavidyalay kapgari jhargram professor dr nimai chandra masan principal government general degree college mohanpur uh, dr shomit kumar maithi organizing secretary assistant professor in hod department of english and also the coordinator of iqc shri bharati mahavidyalay sik tarik ali joint convener assistant professor department of english government general degree college mohanpur poshchim midnapur west bengal and all the others and the stakeholders who are associated with this webinar now uh, i might i request uh, dr shomit kumar maithi uh, to introduce the theme of the webinar to our audience and set the ball rolling over to you sir uh, <clears throat> good evening am i audible yes, yes sir. sir oh yes sir Uh, good evening, everybody. Myself, Dr. Swamit Kumar Maithi, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of English, and IQC Coordinator of Seva Bharati Mahavidyalaya. As the Organizing Secretary and Convener of this three-day international webinar, I cordially welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, you know that the theme or the focal theme of this three-day international webinar is. climate change human rights and literature which is scheduled to be jointly organized by the department of english and iqsc seva bharati mahavidyalaya jhargram west bengal india and the department of english government general degree college mohanpur poshchim medipur west bengal india uh, and this is scheduled to be held from 14th march to 16th march at the outset i express my heartfelt gratitude and sincere thanks to the chief patron of this webinar dr babulal mahato administrator seva bharati mahavidyalaya for his kind consent to organize uh, this webinar i am also thankful to the patrons of this webinar professor dr deboprasad sahu principal seva bharati mahavidyalaya and professor dr nimai chand mashanto principal government general degree college at mohanpur for their kind cooperation motivation and administrative support for organizing this webinar participants as you all know that the focal theme of the webinar is climate change human rights and literature climate change stands out as the greatest threat to humanity today and it poses serious risks to the fundamental rights of life sustenance shelter sanitation health and adequate standard of living of people across the world it is also responsible for the frequent occurrence of disasters which are more frequent and more violent in the anthropocene era however whether natural or human induced climate change disturbs the social ecological system aggravate the social economic political conditions and involve the issues of justice human rights and equality the impacts of climate change are always disproportionately experienced by the people of the different parts of the world because of diverse and complex social economic cultural and geopolitical factors climate change impacts health and brings about irrevocable changes in ecology 
bringing about displacement and migration of population disruption and violence climate change disproportionately affects the disadvantaged communities because of inequitable distribution of resources and disparity in socio economic status the unprecedented growth of industrial infrastructures and deforestation causes the lives hazardous of indigenous people and the rights of the aboriginal people are as you know violated the rise of global petrodollar economy and the use of fossil fuel increases the ramification of crisis mitigation disaster disaster uh, sorry migration disaster and hazardous this gradual and unexpected changes of biodiversity affect economical and social democratic rights of countless individuals fictional representations of climate change are very effective methods to encounter the environmental crisis environmental narratives are therefore people's response to the crisis in the forward to the global ecologies and the environmental humanities post colonial approaches deepesh chakraborty very pertinently argues an essential ingredient of the process by which humans make sense of the crisis in public life or feel inspired to work towards solutions is stories narratives we tell ourselves in order to find our bearings in a new situation our success in developing a globally con concerted response to the climate crisis for instance will depend on the degree to which we can tell stories that we can take we can all agree on narratives literary visual and cinematic thus serve an important fun function to make people aware of, of the looming dangers of climate change and violation of human rights we are really fortunate that in this evening <coughs> we have among us the distinguished professor an internationally acclaimed researcher and writer richard carriage author course director ma in creative writing coordinator of research and graduate studies in the humanities bath spa university uk who has his enormous contributions to the field of nature writing and eco criticism environmental literature environmental uh, studies and humanities i convey my hearty thanks and sincerest gratitude for his kind acceptance uh, of our invitation and for his kind consent to deliver the keynote address in this international webinar i on behalf of the organizing committee extend my warm welcome to you sir for this webinar, to this webinar i am extremely delighted to announce that we have among us in this evening another remarkable academician and researcher as the resource person dr jolly das associate <laughs> professor department of english vidyasagar university midnapur west bengal i convey my profound gratitude and sincere thanks for your uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you sir thank you for elaborating on the theme of the webinar yeah. may i now request uh, sorry mr rick uh, sarkar i did not yet finish because someone else disturbing so sorry i'm sorry uh, sorry sir that i'll cut you in sorry okay now we have four distinguished professors and scholars to discuss the diverse aspects of the webinar dr omit rahul boishyo director of graduate studies associate professor department of english university of oklahoma usa professor pankaj siksaria associate professor center for technology alternative alternatives for rural areas and associate faculty center for policy studies iit bombay professor shugoto hazra school of oceanographic studies jadavpur university kolkata and professor devasis bondobadhay department of english rabindra bharati university kolkata i 
cordially welcome them to this international webinar and express my hearty thanks and profound gratitude for accepting our invitation. We have four paper presentation sessions in this three-day international webinar in which we have four honorable chairpersons, uh, Professor Joyji Ghos, Department of English, Vidyasagar University, Mignapur, West Bengal, India, uh, Professor Indranil Acharya, uh, Professor and Head, Department of English, Vidyasagar University, Pashtim Bendipur, West Bengal, Dr. Ujjal Jana, Associate Professor, Department of English, Pondicherry University, and uh, Dr. Devdas Roy, Associate Professor, Department of English, Vidyasagar University, Pashtim um, Bendipur, West Bengal. I extend a warm welcome to all the honorable chairpersons to this webinar. We have received as many as 25 high quality research papers from the faculties, researchers and students from various colleges and universities across the globe. And I welcome all the paper presenters to this webinar. And with this very short introduction, I now uh, request Professor uh, Mr. Rick Sorka to proceed. Over to you, Mr. Rick Sorka. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you uh, for elaborating on the theme of the webinar and uh, my apologies for the intrusion. Uh, may I now request uh, Professor Dr. Deo Prashad Shao, uh, Principal Shao Bharati Mahavidyala, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Myself, Dr. Deo Prashad Shao, Principal. Sivabharati Mahapitaloy, Jargam, West Bengal, India, and the chairperson of this international webinar. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all the honorable guests, resource persons, delegates, and participants to this three days international webinar on climate change, human rights, and literature, which is organized by Department of English and IQSC, Seva Bharati Mohabidalai, Kapgari Jhargram, West Bengal, in collaboration with Department of English, Government General Degree College, Mohanpur, Pashtim Mednapur, West Bengal, India. I feel honored to welcome all the research persons of this three days international webinar in this auspicious occasion. Professor Richard Carrot author and course director, MA in Creative Writing, coordinator of research, research and graduate studies in the humanities, Bath Spa University, UK, Professor Sugoto Hajra, School of Oceanographic Studies, Jadavpur University, Kolkata, India, Professor Devasis Bandopadhyay, Department of English, Robindo Bharati University, Kolkata, Dr. Amit Kumar Boisha, Director of Graduate Studies, Associate Professor, Department of English, University of Oklahoma, USA, Dr. Jolly Das, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English, Vidyasagar University, Midnapur, West Bengal, Professor Pankaj Sebasaria, Sekhsaria, Associate Professor, Center for Technology Alternative for Rural Areas and Associate Faculties, Center for Policy Studies, IIT Bombay. I feel privileged to welcome all the chairpersons of the three days international webinar, Professor Joyjit Ghosh, Department of English, Vidyasagar University, Midnapur, West Bengal, Professor Indronil Acharya, Department of English, Vidyasagar University, Pushim Innapur, West Bengal, India. Dr. Ujjal Jana, Associate Professor, Department of English, Pondicherry University, Pondicherry, India. Our college, Seva Bharati Mahavidyalay, was established on 17th July 1964 by Dr. P.K. Sen, an eminent educationist who was promoted by the urgent necessity of providing the young minds of the remote poor village and its adjacent areas with quality higher education. The name Seva Bharati suggests that 
the ideal Indian can only be constituted on the noble principle of seva or service. The word Bharati is also highly significant. One meaning of Bharati is speech, another is learning. The college is dedicated to this noble service since its establishment and it has completed its 50 years of glorious service to the nation. The motto of the college is Tapusha, Seva and Pragati, which means that the development of either the nation or of the individual is a progressive concept, which can be achieved through sincere contemplation and selfless service. The education can only be achieved through Tapusha. As Swami Vivekananda says, to me, the very essence of education is concentration of mind. Our vision is to transform our Mahavidyalaya into a center of excellence in the arena of higher education and contribute to the inclusive development of the country by generating quality human resources. The Mahavidyalaya aims at the holistic development of the young learners and hopes to mold them into young citizens of the nation who are dependable, honest, committed and possesses a sound value system. Swami Vivekananda says, education is not the amount of information that is put into your brain and runs riot there undigested all your life. We must have life building, man making, character making, assimilation of ideas. I am sure that this international webinar is going to be a vibrant and fruitful platform for academic discussion with the participants from various colleges, universities, and academic institutions. Finally, I extend my genuine sense of appreciation to the members of organizing committee, technical assistants, and other members of the international webinar. I extend my heartily thanks Dr. Sumit Kumar Maiti, HOD Department of English and Coordinator IQSC, a convener of this international webinar, Mr. Rick Sarkar, Assistant Professor, Department of English and Joint Coordinator of this International Webinar and Professor Nimai Chan Masanto, Principal, Government General Degree College, Mohanpur and all his team members. I am very much thankful to them. Last but not the least, this International Webinar is for the academic development for the student community. I whole heartily welcome all the students to participate in this webinar to make it a fruitful and memorable one. I declare this three days international webinar is open. I wish a grand success of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your words of uh, your words will uh, truly be a source of inspiration to us. And I can see uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Richard Carriage has already joined us. Uh, we will be beginning very shortly. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, before that, I would uh, request uh, Professor Dr. Nimai Chandu Masang, uh, Principal Government General Degree College, Mohanpur, to uh, say a few words on this occasion. Sir, please. Okay. Good evening. Good evening to the all resource persons. And good evening to Dr. Deva Prasad Sahu, Principal Shiva Bharati Mahavidyalaya to the faculty members of Shiva Bharati Mahavidyalaya, to my distinguished colleagues, other guests, participants, scholars, friends from India and abroad, and my dear students. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the Department of English, Shiva Bharati Mahavidyalaya, and the English Department of our college for organizing an international conference through uh, webinar, as we call it uh, these days 
on a very interesting and important subject. I thank the principal and the faculty members of the Department of English, Seva Bharati Mohabit Daloy, for being agreed to collaborate with us in organizing this seminar, a so-called webinar. That young college, uh, like Mohanpur Government College, established in the year 2015, which is located in the far off border area of West Bengal, nearest to Odisha. And we are organizing this kind of academic program in collaboration with the esteemed college like Seva Bharati Mohabit Daloy, with globally acclaimed academicians, is really a matter of pride for all of us. There can be no doubt that uh, the topic selected for the conference is significant as well as relevant in the present context when climate related risks and threatish weather events have been so profoundly impacting our lives in so many multiple ways that it is impossible anyone to deny the reality of the climate change. Climate change stands out as the greatest threat to, to the human survival on planet Earth today. It poses serious risks to the fundamental rights of life, sustenance, shelter, health, and adequate standard of living of people across the world. The human rights implication of anthropogenic climate change is certainly one of the most important concerns in today's world. I am no expert on climate change. However, I wish you, after the end of three days discussion, deliberation and interaction, you would come forward with some important messages, particularly for our students, who are the future inhabitants of this humanized and weather afflict art. I wish the conference all success. I hope that new ideas will emerge and we will have new insights into the human rights dimension of climate change. Thanks you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for your words of wisdom. Now, it gives me immense pleasure to have uh, Professor Richard Carriage among us. And to do the honors, may I now request Sek Tari Kani to introduce our keynote speaker to the audience. Over to you, Mr. Tari Kani. Yes, uh, Mr. Tarikali, kindly introduce our speaker to the audience. Yes, just one minute. Sure. Hello and good evening. Uh, now this is the time to start the first technical session of the three days conference. And we are fortunate to have uh, Professor Richard Courage as the keynote speaker of this three days conference. Professor Kerries does not need an introduction. He is popular and a globally recognized name in the field of environmental humanities. Professor Kerries is an author and a course director, MA in creative writing and coordinator of research and graduate studies in the humanities, Bath Spa University, UK. He loves to call himself a nature writer and literary eco-critic. His major areas of interest include eco-criticism, nature writing, creative writing, especially prose fiction and nature writing, contemporary novels and poetry, the writer, writer and place, and writing and politics. Some of his important publications include Writing the Environment, Eco-Criticism and Literature, published in 1998, The Face of the Earth, Natural Landscape, Science and Culture, published in 2011. His most famous work is perhaps Cold Blood, his nature, nature writing memoir about the British reptiles and amphibians, their meanings and his fascination with them dating from his childhood. Beside this, he has written a number of articles and book chapters on environmental literature and green writings. His nature writing has been published in BBC Wildlife, Grant Online and Poetry Review. He has also received the BBC Wildlife Award for Nature Writing in 1990 and 1991 
and the Roger Deakin Award from the Society of Authors for, for 2012. So without much ado, I hand over this virtual space to Professor Kerridge. We're actually super excited to uh, listen to his talk. But before uh, Professor Kerridge starts his presentation, there is a request for the audience. I request all the participants to uh, keep their video and audio off during Kerridge's presentation. If you have any question and queries, you can write them in the chat box. We will take them one by one in the interactive session. Thank you. Now over to you, Professor Courage. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you to the host universities and especially to Dr. Samit Kumar Moti for giving me this opportunity to speak with you today. It is an honor. Namaskar. I, can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Is that visible to you? Uh, just um, I'm sharing, sharing it on the screen, sir. Yes. A minute, just a minute. Sir. Excellent. Excellent. Is it, is it visible? Yes, that's good. Can you all still hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Good. I'm going to talk about the problems that the subject of climate change pose uh, for writers. Uh, that is to say, literary writers, creative writers, primarily of fiction, poetry, or literary nonfiction. And I'm going to give a number of examples, and I'm going to say a little bit about the theoretical arguments about literary representation. Uh, and I want to start here with, can I get the first slide? And, uh, can, we, can we move to number two? Yes. Uh, I want to start with the eco-critic Timothy Clarke in his book, The Cambridge Introduction to Literature and the Environment. Clarke suggests that the major problem for literary writers presented by climate change is what he calls the derangements of scale that the subject imposes upon us. And here, is his first example. Environmental slogans urge us eat less meat and help save the planet. Or they follow horrifying predictions of climate change with injunctions no less solemn not to leave electrical appliances on standby or overfill the kettle. Such language which have seemed surreal or absurd to an earlier generation, and enacts a bizarre derangement of scales, collapsing, sorry, I've lost it, collapsing the trivial and the catastrophic into each other. What troubles Clark about this is that because climate change belongs to such immensities in space and time because climate change stretches both into the past and in the future and stretches across the planet in terms of the causal relationships in the climate system between different parts of the world it defies representation in contemporary literary terms and another way in which climate change defies representation is that it confuses our sense of what is important and what is trivial. He explores this idea as well in his later book, Eco-Criticism at the Edge, published in 2015. A powerful reason why we find these problems so difficult to act upon 
And while literature and the other arts find them so difficult to represent, is that they play havoc with our accustomed sense scale. Can we have the next slide, please? Is it visible, sir? Yes, that's great. Thank you. When is climate change? When did it start? Or when does it start? Or when will it start? It is possible to say that the process started back as far as the shift in various parts of the world from hunter-gatherer subsistence to agricultural settlement. Or again, the chain of events can be said to have started with the beginnings of industrial mass production using the fossil fuels, coal and oil. Yet, in most of the world, especially the affluent parts of the world, climate change has not yet happened. That is, it has not yet manifested itself in events so disastrous that they force the mass of people to recognise what is happening and make changes. This is why denial is still possible. Extreme weather events can still be said to be within the range of normal or natural occurrence. Climate change is futuristic. It will really happen, really kick off in perhaps 30 or perhaps 50 or perhaps 80 years time. And we are constantly given countdown scenarios for the possibility of saving ourselves from the worst effects. Five years in which we can still make a difference. Three, then another three. The catastrophe has not yet happened. And yet, in a sense, it has already happened, since we are also told that severe effects may already be unavoidable. Now, not yet already. This is why there are so many arguments over the start of the proposed new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. This concept, the Anthropocene, the new geological epoch in which human activity has become a major climate forcing agent, is it for Clark an emergent scale effect. That is, uh, sorry, I've lost the slide again. Uh, there it is. That is, at a certain indeterminate threshold, numerous human actions insignificant in themselves, heating a house, clearing trees, flying between the continents, forest management, come together to a new, imponderable physical event altering the basic ecological cycles of the planet. The force of the notion of a carbon footprint. Sorry, I'll go on to that. The force of the notion of a carbon footprint relates to scale effects. If it were just a matter of my own emissions, there would be no controversy and no need for the idea of a personal footprint. And he asks, can the Leviathan of humanity en masse as a geological force be represented in writing? And his answer is no, at least not in the realist mode still dominant in the novel. Its modes of appearance as a totality are only in graphs, statistics, computer projections and modelling of CO2 emissions, population figures, waste generation, proportion of plants used and so on. Spatial scale represents similar problems. Where is climate change? Can I see it happening somewhere in my field of vision? Or can it be brought within the narrative point of view of a fictional character? This is so difficult because climate change is so much larger in its field of operation than the space any character can see. The climate is a global system. Pollution on one side of the world changes the climate on the other. This is all the more so in our system of globalised capitalism, which has so greatly increased the intricacy of trade and employment relations 
between different parts of the globe. The immensity, the indeterminacy and the elusiveness of climate change's spatial scale and temporal scale have prompted the eco-philosopher Timothy Clark, sorry, Timothy Morton, to call global warming a hyper object. That is an object so extended and unevenly distributed in time and space that we are always already inside it. There is no vantage point, no position outside or above it from which its entirety is seen. And similarly, from one point of view, on one scale, my own carbon footprint is trivial, but multiplied on a different scale, it is catastrophic. The dilemma is summed up by a comment made in 2007 by the, John, John, the novelist John Lanchester in the London books. He says, I suspect we're reluctant to think about climate change because we're worried that if we start, we will have no choice but to think about nothing else. Here we have the polarization of two extremes. They are incommensurable. There is no compromise that seems possible between them. Either we will not think about climate change at all, which will leave us defenseless, merely waiting for it to happen, or we will be unable to think about anything else. And this would be a negation of selfhood. And from a novelist's point of view, it would mean the complete disappearance of character and plot absorbed into abstract information. Startling transformations of literary orientation and form are required. Uh, and for Clark, part of the problem is conventional fictional character because a novel or indeed a, a, a non-fiction work such as an autobiography or memoir makes the personal lifespan into the main time frame of the fiction and in that personal lifespan conventionally certain events are hugely important while others are trivial can we imagine a novel in which the most important plot points are not whether a character falls in love or whether they manage to escape a murderer, but rather whether they turn the light or decide not to travel by aeroplane? Can we imagine this? It defies our conventional notion of plot. Um, and Clark's perception here is consistent with the project of the most recent wave of eco-criticism, um, which is generally called material eco-criticism uh, and is consistent with, is related to the philosophical movement known as new materialism. So if we look at slide four, we can see, I think, a, a really quick and beautiful summary of the project of new materialism by the eco-critic Hannes Bergthaler. He says, its intellectual project is a redescription of the world that dissolves the singular figure of the human subject distinguished by unique properties, soul, reason, mind, free will or intentionality into the dense web of material relations in which all things are enmeshed. Thus, instead of representing the point of view of a character, as novels generally do, should we try to find the point of view of the ecosystem with all its component parts 
and the whole community or assemblage of creatures that inhabit it and constitute it are continually making it. What, what literary forms would be equal to that task? What is advocated is a shift of emphasis in the way we imagine the self. From the self as an atomized individual with hard boundaries to a self always already in the process of producing the world and being produced by it. A self through which the world flows. A self that is as conceptually inseparable as it is materially inseparable from the larger ecosystem that sustains its physical body. Ecological perception dissolves unifying notions of selfhood and strong dualistic separations between culture and nature or subject and object or human and non-human. Instead of these hard selves and boundaries, we have shared ancestry, co-evolution, system, process, energy flow, hybridity, actor networks, post-humanism, symbiosis, biosemiotics, the system of relationships that Timothy Morton calls the mesh and new materialists call distributed agency. And yet, the implications for literary form have not been very much explored. What are novelists to do with this new emphasis? Mm -hmm. At the moment, it has often been observed, Amitav Ghosh has observed, for example, that realism in fiction seems defeated by climate change, seems unable to engage with it or represent it. Instead, we have the apocalyptic genre um, or the post-apocalyptic genre, um, which seems to be so often taking the lead when it comes to this subject. And in answering the question of how literature is responding and can respond, to these problems of representation. I want to make a distinction between two aspects that climate change may have for us and for writers. Both of them seem to be inadequate, and yet they seem to dominate at the moment. One of these is the apocalypse, and the other is what we'll call the background murmur. But let's begin with the apocalypse. Could I please have slide number five? Did you say and here are just a few examples of apocalyptic writing. Um, the, the best known of these is undoubtedly The Road by Cormac McCarthy. The first one there, um, a novel which I'm sure some of you know, um, an American novel um, which has been referred to as the most important environmental novel ever written. That was said by the environmental campaigner George Monbiot. Um, it tells the story of a father and son walking down a road in a devastated post-apocalyptic America. They are trying to reach the sea because they believe or the father partly believes that they may find some sort of escape from the devastated continent or perhaps a part of the continent that has been spared some of the effects. It isn't clear why the continent has been devastated. The, what seems to have happened is that all of life except human life, more or less, has been eliminated. There is still some microbial life because there are still processes of decay. But apart from that, all the trees, all the plants, all the animals seem to have gone. It's not very clear what could have produced this. In fact, scientifically, I'm not sure that there is any plausible candidate, although at times um, McCarthy 
hinted that he was thinking of a super volcano. However, perhaps that's the point that he didn't want his scenario to be identified with any particular disaster, even climate change. He wanted it to be the general principle of the apocalyptic landscape that could apply to a variety of possible causes. Um, what the apocalyptic strategy in fiction usually does is to give us some kind of warning. This is where we are heading. This is how the world will be if we don't change our behavior. Um, modern versions often make use of the road novel or the road story as a structure. Um, a party of characters is usually making some sort of dangerous journey to the place where they hope they can start again. They hope they can discover or start uh, a new settled community or perhaps find um, a part of the world that has been spared. Um, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower is another example. And the road format is useful to any novelist who wants to give a tour of the ruined world and explore a range of responses to the catastrophe. Other novels make the development of the catastrophe the main body of the novel. Uh, Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake is a science fiction novel that does this. Um, and characteristically in novels like that, the strategy is to look back from a viewpoint in the midst of the crisis at the chain of events that led to the crisis. Uh, in Oryx and Crake, the main character or focaliser, Snowman, may be the last surviving human being, apart from a genetically engineered human-animal hybrid species whose points of view are never revealed to the reader. This novel thus belongs to the last person on earth subgenre of apocalyptic fiction, in which the lone survivor has space to reflect upon the catastrophe and its causes. In these novels, it is a convention that the character narrator, the last survivor, should be relatively calm, not emotionally overwhelmed or traumatized to the point of incoherence as in real life one might expect. Whether or not this calmness is credible, it is necessary for the sake of the coherence and composure of the narrative. But it adds to the air of unreality produced by such an extreme and hypothetical scenario. The, the air of unreality that may be said to be both the novel's and the reader's defense against the idea of the real danger. The unreality is because the emotional implications of the novel are palpably not being explored as realism would seek to explore them. To engage with this scenario emotionally might be unbearable. Another aspect of this unreality is the basic incongruity between this last person scenario and the act of narration that gives us the novel. To whom is the narrative addressed? And for what reason? Since the scenario is one in which the terminal disaster has occurred, the motive of warning, which is the real extra textual motive for the novel, cannot be naturalized, cannot be made internal to the novel and the character. In, fi in the fiction, it is too late for the warning. And this is particularly true in McCarthy's The Road. The question is whether our acceptance of this convention of the last person as the narrator the sheer, uh, enables to, us to accept the sheer implausibility of the tone of voice from the other side of the apocalypse. If not, the danger is that the novel's inability to entertain the real implication of its scenario will drain the force from the warning 
and instead resemble our own general inability in our own time to take global warming seriously, even when we profess to do so. To imagine seriously the viewpoint of someone who has experienced the catastrophe should be all but impossible, all but incompatible with our continuing inaction. It should be intolerable until we relieve the horror by acting, by doing something about climate change. But we remain stopped on the threshold, unable to become the people who will act. And until we do act, these scenarios must seem unreal. McCarthy shows us a man on the other side of catastrophe, looking back at the world he once had. And that is our world, the world we are currently still positioned in. At one point, he and his son happen upon the house in which the father grew up. In one room, he remembers sitting there doing his homework. His fingers find the holes in the mantelpiece where Christmas stockings hung. What futures did he imagine in those days? Momentarily, he projects himself back into the child as the child, the child that he once was imagines projecting himself forward into an imaginary future. This is the line I've given you here in slide six. The man says, this is where I used to sleep. My cot was against this wall. In the nights in their thousands to dream the dreams of a child's imaginings, worlds rich or fearful, such as might offer themselves but never the one to be. He and his former self contemplate each other strangely, the child looking forward, the man looking back, but their gazes cannot meet. It is the reader occupying the position of the child who has to try to project himself or herself into that future. What if I were there? What if I were looking back on the, from the other side of that catastrophe? For a moment, the prose assumes the stylized form of literary elegy, registering the weight of what the man could feel if he gave way. Raw, cold daylight fell from the roof, gray as his heart. The release of these feelings is no more possible in this ashen world than the appearance of green shoots. Informed imagination of the future cannot be expected of the child at whom the man looks back, but the man is also looking back at all of us, the novel's pre-catastrophe readers gazing into this dreadful future. The scene challenges the reader to join the dots, correct connecting our own time with the man's, the speaker's. We are challenged, that is, to acknowledge the ecological relationship between our actions now and his experience in that future. He is fictional, but he has a terrible potential to become real as our possible child or our possible future self, unless we act to prevent the catastrophe. And when he contemplates his own son, he thinks this. He turned and looked at the boy. Maybe he understood that for the first time, that to the boy, he was himself an alien, a being from a planet that no longer existed, the tales of which were suspect. He could not construct for the child's pleasure the world he had lost 
without constructing the loss as well. And he thought perhaps the child had known this better than he. The man is a transitional character. He belongs to our world. He cannot forget our normality. And yet he cannot get back to that normality. It has been destroyed forever. His son, although his son was born, of course, shortly before the catastrophe, nevertheless, he has no conscious memory of that pre-catastrophic world. He is entirely an inhabitant of the catastrophic future. When the father dies, and at the end of the novel he does, the last memory of the world we know will die with him. The world that this novel conjures is so pitiless, so devoid of any kind of protective community. One has to ask, can the cruelty to the reader be justified? The, the, the novel at times uses horror film techniques. Um, there is an episode in which the father and son discover a cellar where chained pleading prisoners are waiting to be butchered alive by the cannibal gangs that roam this devastated world. And the technique there is almost like that of a horror film or slasher film. There's just a brief, sudden glimpse of horror and then the two run away. The whole novel, novel gets its sensationalism by playing upon vulnerable points of anxiety, especially the anxiety of parents for their children. What could justify this? Perhaps there's one argument that does, at least partially. The, the book, of course, like all novels, cannot really very easily have a great tangible effect upon the behavior of people in real life. Um, and this novel has no real practical wisdom to offer. It's only there as a sort of deterrent to frighten us. But there is a way in which it may be the most uncompromising work of environmental fiction so far. Though the premise is not wholly realistic, the working through of that premise is done with sufficient realism for the scenario to be all but intolerable. The challenge to empathy here is from realism itself, from our sense of how unbearable it would be to go far into imagining ourselves in, these, in the position of this man or this boy. McCarthy's intolerable scenario could be a way of saying to consumerist readers trapped in the impasse of knowing about global warming but not acting until you face the reality of what you are doing a realistic novel has to be intolerable to you it should burn you forcing you to drop it so there we have the apocalyptic genre but instead i want to uh, in the last part of the talk describe some alternatives which, as I say, belong to what I've called the genre of background murmur. The genre, uh, that is to say, of which records how we currently live with climate change if we are not one of those communities who happen already to be feeling the effects of the extreme weather. Um, that is to say, we live with it as a kind of unease, as a set of fragments of news that at times tr trouble us, at times terrify us, but much of the time we ignore or suppress or force into the background. And there are certain forms of irony that um, emerge from that kind of writing uh, that kind of subject matter. So turning then to slide seven, here are several examples of what I called the literature of the background murmur. Um, the first is a short story uh, by Dave Eggers, which appears in this collection called How We Are Hungry. 
Uh, this story, very short story, called Your Mother and I, takes the form of a speech by a father to his daughter of 12 or 13 as they prepare nachos together. Nonchalantly, the father explains how your mother and I persuaded the world to prevent global warming at some time in the past. Uh, and that is on slide number eight. I told you about that, didn't I? What about when your mother and I moved the world to solar energy and wind power to hydro, all that? Can you hand me that cheese? It was all pretty simple, converting most of the nation's electricity. At a certain point, everyone knew that we had to just suck it up and pay the money because, holy crap, it really was expensive at first to set up the cities to make their own power. All these solar panels and windmills on the city buildings, they weren't always there, you know. No, they weren't. Look at some pictures, honey. They just weren't. And after that, your mother and I went on to solve some of the world's other great problems. Anyway, we were on a roll, so we got rid of genocide. They instituted a global minimum wage, made sure that AIDS inhibiting drugs would be available free worldwide, ensured that elections in the USA would be public funded only, and banished corporate lobbying from the political system. Um, describing these feats, the father is self-congratulatory. He also mildly embarrasses his daughter by boasting coyly about the great sex the parents were enjoying while they were accomplishing all these things. This is another derangement of scale. The greatest achievements that to us appear almost impossible, dauntingly difficult, are discussed here as if they were within the scope of just ordinary, irritating boasting. The enigmatic little story here, only a few pages long and consisting of just the one speech, uses dissonance between tone and subject matter as an effect of making strange, or as Clark would have it, twisting scale. Changes we are accustomed to seeing as desperately needed but hugely difficult are talked about in retrospect as having been simple and straightforward. People quickly came to ex accept them for granted. This is the maddening, shimmering possibility that environmentalists glimpse. The idea that once some sort of collective psychological breakthrough has been made, the priorities will become obvious to all. And it is our present consumerist addictions, not the solutions, that will seem remote and absurd. In this story, the possibility almost takes shape, but then slips away, dissipating in the increasingly perplexing list of achievements. Dissonance between tone and subject matter thwarting the reader's response is a literary symptom here of the impasse that we have reached, our seeming inability to make our actions consistent with our knowledge. In my second novel here, uh, which we can see, on, we can see some bits of it on slide nine, this is Jenny Offill's novel called Weather published in 2020. A different strategy is used here, responding to the same sense that conventional linear narrative cannot represent the scale of the climate change process. Ophel is influenced also by the way in which social media platforms such as Twitter or Facebook chop up their material into chunks and give us incessant streams of short snatches of information, comment or experience, rather than a coherent whole, while YouTube and Instagram do the same thing with short films or visual images. Ophil tells her story in these short chunks. Sheila Hetty, a novelist and memoirist who uses a similar form, says that Jenny Ophil conjures 
an entire world with her near pointiest technique. One feels a whole heaving, breathing universe behind her every line. This is an important feature of the technique, the use of space between the fragments. As in modernist collage poetry, each fragment is a sample of a much larger possibility. It could go on for longer. We could disappear into it, but we don't. We hold back. We only receive the fragments. And again, that is representative of our impasse around climate change. And here are some of them. This is the story of uh, the main character who works for an environmentalist called Sylvia um, answering her letters. I swear the hippie letters are a hundred times more boring than the end timer ones. They're all about composting toilets and water conservation and electric cars and how to live lightly on the earth while thinking ahead for seven generations. Environmentalists are so dreary, I tell Sylvia. I know, I know, she says. Some of the people at this private dinner have begun to invest in floating cities, the kind that can be anchored in international waters and run by unmeddlesome governments. But our hosts are gentler sorts, long-time listeners, they say. They take notes during Sylvia's talk, but in the end, they still have one nagging question. What would be the safest place? No one they'd consulted with would give them a straight answer. But you've interviewed everyone. Is there any consensus? Any clustering patterns of these scientists and journalists? We're not asking for ourselves, but we have children, you understand. The problem is that when he's left to his own devices, he just watches those scenes of refugees trying to make their way to safety over and over again. They keep showing pictures of this one island that is running out of resources. The people who live there have formed their own rescue teams. The fishermen go out in their boats and pull survivors out of the water. Others bring dry clothes to the beach. It's important to be on the alert for the decisive moment, says the man next to me who is talking to his date. I agree. The only difference is that he is talking about 20th century photography and I am talking about 21st century everything. And the fragmentation of the text represents the refusal to arrive of that decisive moment, that moment when climate change actually occupies a single space and moment. It's actually finally happened. Everybody has to see that it's happened and then we will act. But by then it will be too late. Hence the impasse enacted by this fragmentation, this stream and proliferation of worlds none of which we will commit ourselves to as readers, from all of which we stand back, receiving only short glimpses. There is something similar on a larger scale in my next example, Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry of the Future, a huge novel uh, which tries to cover roughly the next 40 or 50 years and is an optimistic novel in which it represents the world in many different stories from right across the world coming to terms with climate change, taking decisive action, doing something about it. The leading country to do so is India. After a catastrophic heat wave, in India, um, which has killed hundreds of thousands of people, the Indian government acts to seed the upper atmosphere and thus slow down global warming and prevent such an event occurring again, at least for the next few years. And this triggers an international response uh, or many responses in different parts of the world, coordinated by this imaginary uh, United Nations creation, the Ministry for the Future. And the form of the novel is partly, again, it's fragmentary. It consists of chapters from different points of view, interspersed with much shorter pieces, some of which are dipping in, for example, to the point of view in the first one here of an Indian pilot 
who is involved in this atmosphere seeding operation, uh, or the personification of history, or the voice of a photon, or the representative of a permaculture project in Argentina. These different voices which can't exactly inhabit the same space or produce a coherent narrative together are nevertheless contributing to the larger global narrative with which the novel pre presents us. The, the cost of this though, of course, is that we cannot become very engaged or very deeply involved in any one of these characters. Uh, in that sense, the novel might be said to transfer its emotional depth from the character to the whole global biosphere or ecosystem or, in, or human community. Which is what, at the beginning, of course, uh, the, those new material eco-critics that I talked about at the beginning are asking us to do. Quickly, um, a couple of Final examples, uh, my next one, Gene Spracklin's book Strands, is a non-fiction work in which she describes uh, a series of walks on a beach near Liverpool where she lives, uh, and each chapter is about something she finds on the beach on one of these walks, and in this chapter she looks at the plastic litter that she finds on the beach. So here we have in slide 11, First of all, she makes a list. This is only a small part of it, a list of these objects. Petrol can, one. Drinks carton, two. Sanitary towel wrapper, 13. Sweet wrapper, 39. Chocolate bar wrapper, 49. Toy dinosaur, one. Rope, two. Chris packet, four. Bart Simpson stencil, one. Isolate wrapper, seven. And so on. It goes on for several pages. These items are again defying our sense of scale. Some of them have a touching innocence. They are small. They belong to the tasks of an ordinary day. Many are childish. How could they do any harm? And yet they are filling up the world and Spracklin's perspective moves from this tiny ordinary spot on the beach out to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, said to be twice the size of Texas, where because of the tides, all the pla so much of the plastic litter seems to be accumulating as a kind of continent-sized entity. And yet, on the one hand, there you have a derangement of scale in which we have to leap from the immediate and the familiar to the grotesquely large. There is a similar derangement of scale when we consider plastic in the context of time. Sprackland asks, can we even imagine a world without plastic? What was life like before it so thoroughly colonized our homes, offices, vehicles, streets, shops, gardens, and parks? Its success story has been so phenomenal that it's hard to say what we would be without it. Our grandparents would know. We've only been mass producing plastic since the 1930s. There was a time within living memory when plastic was a rare sight and a novelty. So still within living memory, just about, there was a world, and you can see perhaps here the link with the, the memories of the character in McCarthy's The Road, there are still people alive who can remember a world in which mass-produced plastic hadn't yet arrived. It wasn't there. And now it seems to be so much out of control that it is filling up the world all around us in its tiny little nurdles, those tiny little balls of plastic, submicroscopic almost, that are filling up the sea, and entities the size of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Again, we are powerless to present the movement from the tiniest scale to the largest. Um, and it has happened far more quickly than such events should, according to our accustomed sense of scale. My last example comes from Amin Dakosh's recent non-fiction work, The Nutmeg's Curse, 
parables for a planet as i'm sure you know gosh is one of our leading and most adventurous formerly experimental writers about climate change from his novel the hungry tide through its sequel gun island to this book published last year the nutmeg's curse and gosh's strategy here is first of all of course to relate climate change and the Anthropocene to the history of colonialism. I talked earlier about the difficulty in identifying the moment when the Anthropocene begins. Gosh says that this question cannot be separated from the moment or series of moments when colonialism began. And to try very conspicuously to scale down this question and make it produce a single narrative, he chooses a single commodity, the spice nutmeg, and identifies particularly the story of the Banda Islands and the massacre carried out by Dutch colonialists in order to achieve a nutmeg monopoly for the export of the spice to Europe. And Gosch says, much, if not most, of humanity today lives as colonialists once did, viewing the earth as though it were an inert entity that exists primarily to be exploited and profited from, with the aid of technology and science. Yet even the sciences are now struggling to keep pace with the hidden forces that are manifesting themselves in climatic events of unprecedented and uncanny violence. It is essential now as the prospect of planetary catastrophe becomes ever closer, that these non-human voices be restored to our stories. That seems a good moment on which to end. I've only touched the surface of these works, um, and I've done so perhaps in order to show how at the moment in so much of our literature, we are trapped between these different scales. The background murmur is too small to be adequate. The apocalyptic is too large, too frightening, too unbearable to be held in view for very long. Um, at least I think the prospect that works like those I've just looked at, works like those of Jenny Ophill, Amitav Ghosh um, and Jean Sprackland present that possibility is the possibility of beginning to close that gap and beginning to integrate our knowledge with our behaviour. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for this all encrossing and comprehensive analysis of the climate change. And the important thing that came out of your talk is the question or the notion of a post-apocalyptic world, which is quite evident. And unless and until we buckle up and take note of that, it is hardly likely to change. And also yes. you have referred to many texts in order to bolster your argument throughout the presentations. Also mentioned about certain books, insights into certain books, uh, unheard of. And the fact that you ended your talk with Amitabh Ghosh, I think Amitabh Ghosh is a, is a very popular figure as far as the Indian academic circle is concerned. So thank you once yes, again. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you once again, sir. And with yes, that... Indeed. And I am happy to answer some questions if, if, if anybody would like yes, to answer. Yes, uh, with that, yes. I now uh, open the session for questions and discussions. Uh, participants, they can uh, post their questions in the chat box or they can ask the question to Professor Richard Kirish directly. Would like and to I think questions. I think we uh, we have a question from uh, somebody put their hand up, didn't they? Just now, who who was that? Uh, I think it was inadvertent. Yes. Okay. Fine. Yes. Uh, could you have some questions on this beautiful and wonderful presentation on? the divergent aspects of climate crisis. I saw a hand go up just now, but I can't see it now. Yes, uh, the participants are very uh, free to ask questions to Professor Richard Carriage if they want to, or they can post their questions in the chat box.
perhaps there's quite a lot to take in. I, I would certainly be happy as well to talk with people afterwards if they would like to email me. That, that, that quite often happens with conferences. I, 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 I found the, the, the best discussion can happen after the event. Okay. Uh, I would be happy to ask and answer any now. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Yes. Uh, don't you think that technology can be a uh, uh, useful means to mitigate the problems of in climate change and environmental disaster? Well, so what can technology play in this? Yes. Question? I mean, of course, I'm I'm a a literary cultural critic and a writer so i'm not an expert and it seems to me of course it's true that new technologies will have to be involved and i suppose the um the novel that deals with this most of all of the ones i selected was um kim stanley robinson's novel the ministry for the future which i i do recommend i mean it's a novel of huge scale and it's hard to know how accurate all the scientific information in it is you know he it's a work of speculative fiction and that means that it um that the things in it are theoretically possible now but they haven't all happened yet they haven't been fully developed so um so for example he writes about a new technological solution to the melting of the antarctic ice which involves drilling down and freezing the water beneath the ice um this is something that hasn't yet been done but it is uh, a technique that's been proposed and so i think literature has a role in playing with these possible scenarios and trying to work out what would happen if they were put into practice uh similarly there's the uh the event in the novel when the indian government orders this reseeding operation in the atmosphere so yes i mean i think the, the literature I'm looking at does certainly welcome the possibility of technological solutions, but it's also exploring perhaps or trying to explore some of their unintended consequences. But that's right. Um, we've got... Yes, sir. A a few questions. Questions. We've got more questions. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, in the chat box. Um, what can be the... This is Kushbu Lakuputa. What can be the new research directions in climate change in literature? Research directions, yes. I think it, well, there could be many, of course, but I think that the, um, the specific role of literature, at least realist literature, is to explore the emotional and behavioral and psychological consequences of whatever new development happens of um, what climate change begins to do to our world, what it deprives us of, and perhaps what it deprives us of psychologically, you know, in terms of our relationship with the past, in terms of our relationship with the future, our feeling about the world that our children are going to inherit, um, our feeling about how we have lost a world that we expected when we were young. Um, so, um, from that point of view, the role of literature is partly, I suppose, to produce poetic, poetic, powerful symbols about these things. It's partly to give warnings and to inspire us to action, but it's partly simply to explore the way that human beings relate to technological change. Um, Shabiri Das asks, do you think that while depictions of a post-apocalyptic world in climate fiction can and do serve as a warning to us that they also contribute to our inaction by making us believe there is no hope and it might be already too late to act um yes i think that is the great weakness of that genre actually uh and i think you know in a curious way what the apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic work does is to depict a world which is already not our own and so um on the one hand we are powerless to intervene in that world the disaster has already happened on the other hand it doesn't seem absolutely real or relevant anyway so it has a double effect of hopelessness and 
somehow ir ir irrelevant. So, though it can be that that these are difficulties that can be overcome, and I think that the McCarthy novel is so unpleasant. I mean, I really hated this book at first, at first, and then I felt, but it's got to be hateful. That's the only way you can justify the genre. It's got to be unbearable. Um, you know, I think that that is an example of one that overcomes that problem. Um, and thank you, thank you for your thanks for my lecture. Um, and Tariq Ali has raised a hand. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes. Good evening. Sir, uh, a group of eco-critics believe that for understanding the present uh, environmental crisis and climate change problem, we need to look into the past. Yes. Uh, how do you see this? I mean, how much uh, past is important for understanding the present and the future climate change crisis and environmental problems? Well, I think that the environmental problems are always intertwined with political problems and that history is our only way of seeing that. So a lot of eco-critics have been concerned with the relationship between um, environmentalism and decolonization. How can the two be combined? How can the two um, not be antagonistic to each other? Um, of course, an example of this, I suppose, is on the one hand, the love of nature as expressed in industries such as ecotourism, and on the other hand, the love of nature which is expressed in the cultures of indigenous people. And these two things can be enemies, but they can be, they can form alliances, of course. The, the ecotourism can give local communities an incentive to preserve the ecosystems that they live in. Um, so um, frequently, in order to achieve these alliances, you have to acknowledge what happened in the past. You have to have some equivalent of a truth and reconciliation process in which colonialism especially and the way in which people were evicted from their land or um, the in, ecosystems in which they lived were destroyed by the colonial process, that has to be recognized and that has to be acknowledged as the historical background of environmentalism if we are able to move on without saying that environmentalism is discredited by that, um, uh, by that process. Um, because the accusation is often made that those wealthy countries that chopped down their forests and eliminated a lot of their biodiversity, they are now telling the rest of the world not to do so. This is what Bolsonaro says when Western nations object to his plans for the Amazon, but you did it. And of course he's right. Um, the industrial West did destroy much of its ecosystem. It did most of the damage. That doesn't mean it's okay for the rest of the world to do it as well. But perhaps people in the West are the last people who are able to present that message. So, you know, in order to form these alliances, there has to be a lot of mutual recognition, which can only come from understanding of the past, I think. Um, this is Tychicus William. Um, at the beginning, you quoted, eat less meat. Will reducing meat in my diet really help the climate? Well, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but I, <laughs> from what I read, um, as ever, I'm afraid the answer is very complicated. Yes, eating less meat will help the climate. I don't know how much meat you eat already, of course, but for someone in the West who consumes a lot of meat, eating less would, would help because um, the emissions produced by uh, the by large-scale industrial meat production particularly the farming of cattle are catastrophic in their effects the the methane itself contributes to global warming but of course uh, a lot of the deforestation that's going on in the amazon and elsewhere is to provide land for the growing of soya which is primarily for animal foods for the uh, industrial livestock industry and so, there, you know, there is no doubt at all that a vegetarian diet 
has a smaller carbon footprint uh, compared with um, the kind of meat consumption that is normal in the West. However, whether you should give up meat completely is a more complicated question, whether veganism is best for the climate, because there is also the question of how the cycle of fertilization can occur in the land. And the choice for agriculture may well be between, on the one hand, livestock farming, where, of course, you have the manure that naturally fertilizes the land, or you use chemical fertilizers and nitrogens and, um, and go for really intensive industrial vegetable production. And that, of course, has its damaging effects as well. So it's a complicated question. I think eating less, one could probably say, yes, certainly, unless you already eat rather little. But whether you should eat no meat at all is a more complicated question, I think. But there are people who know a lot more about this than I do. Yeah, um, I'd like to add to that, do you feel that veganism is a way forward in terms of dealing with climate crisis? Since well, um, yes, but the it's always a question of scale again, isn't it? It would be a huge improvement if a lot more people became vegan. If meat production disappeared already altogether, though, if everybody became vegan, um, what would the effect of that on biodiversity be? We are living, certainly in, in, in Europe and the United States, we're living in a world where um, the ecosystem has for centuries been formed by the farming of livestock. I think that's that's not true so uniformly in India, but it's certainly true of large areas in India, isn't it? You know, the presence of cattle, it has had the formative effect, cattle especially. Um, and the plant life and the um, fertilization of the soil, these are the products of the presence of cattle and thus the insects and the birds and the other plants, the other animals have evolved in relationship with those cattle. Um, if you suddenly remove the cattle, and of course there would be all sorts of cultural and spiritual consequences to that as well, but if you suddenly remove the cattle and there was no incentive to keep them anymore because everybody was vegan, um, there would be a crash of populations. There would be huge uh, ecological consequences to that, wouldn't there? Okay. Uh, but as I say, many people are more expert on this than I am. Okay, sir. Uh, Should we have one more question? I think there was another one. I can't see any questions there, sir, in the chat box. Uh, I thought I saw another hand go up, but perhaps it didn't. Or perhaps it's gone down. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying this, and I'd be, and I, I hope I can come to some other parts of the conference as well. And I would really, really, genuinely be happy to talk to people online, uh, on email. So, so. I mean, I, you, you've probably got my email address, have you, in the conference literature. So please do, don't hesitate to send me a question if you have one. So if it is possible for you to find Because I'm, I'm not an expert on technology or veganism. Okay. So uh, due to the paucity of time, we would like to end here. We would like to end yes. this session. And uh, thank you, Professor Richard Carriage, uh, for this wonderful discussion. I would like to hear you from in the future and a big Namaskar from us back at you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we come to the end of this session. And now um, may I request uh, Mr. Tariq Ali to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Jolly Das, Associate Professor, Department of English, Bhikdashagar University, to the audience. As ma'am joined. Yeah, thanks. So. Yes, ma'am has joined. Yes. Uh, yes, I'm here, Tariq. Good evening. Yes, uh, yes good evening, ma'am. So, uh, this, in this session, we have Dr. Jolly Das as the plenary speaker. And it is really an immense pleasure to introduce uh, my teacher uh, to the audience. And um, it is really an experience that when you are organizing a webinar and your teacher is speaking there as a resource person. Anyway, uh, Dr. Jolly Das is an associate professor in the Department of English. 
Vidyasagar University, Midnapur, West Bengal. She has published two monographs on Eliot and Carnot. Articles and books, chapters to her credit, mainly focus on uh, Giris Carnot's plays in English. Uh, the areas of her research, research interests include Eliot's writings, Giris Carnot's writings in English, and Loreto education. But one important thing about her that uh, besides her academic engagements, ma'am is also associated with Poschim Bango Kheriya Sabar Kollan Shomiti, an organization co-founded by Mahashata Devi and Gopi Ballab Singh Deo from improving the living conditions of the underprivileged and stigmatized Kheriya Sabar indigenous people of Purulia and Bakoda in West Bengal. Today, ma'am will be speaking on Selubi, Karnar's depictions of the impact of deforestation. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Tariq. Thank you. A uh, very good evening to everybody present on this uh, virtual platform. Uh, it's a very uh, significant day for all of us because we are going to uh, have three days of uh, discussions, deliberations on climate change, human rights and literature, for which I must thank uh, the two uh, respected principals of the colleges engaged in organizing this uh, webinar, uh, Dr. Debu Prashad Shabu, Principal, Sheba Bharati Mohamed Dalai, and Dr. Nimai Jad Moshanto, Principal, Government General Degree College, Mohanpur, both from the part of the nation, the world, uh, the earth, uh, which is uh, related to Vidashagor University. Uh, a very good evening to Professor Kerich. I was listening to him very carefully and I must admit that I have benefited immensely from what he has been saying and I shall definitely get in touch with him, sir. Thank you so much. Of course, my dear younger brothers uh, who are associated uh, academically for their own research with our university, Dr. Shomit Kumar Maiti, Organizing Secretary and Convener. Sheikh Tari Kali joined Convena, Mr. Anantokhara and Mr. Rik Shorkar, my dear students and everybody else present here once more. So uh, I shall share screen in order to bring to you the little which I have been able to put together, which I hope will be of some use uh, to you. So I would like to uh, discuss uh, something about uh, Girish Kannad's uh, contribution to the issues uh, related to today's uh, webinar and uh, they are not directly literary in nature because as we all know Girish Kannad was primarily a playwright. We also know that he was an actor but uh, and a director but uh, we know him as a director of a movie called Utsav, but he has also directed some very significant documentaries and a movie for uh, the government of India, that is the Films Division of India. The documentaries are Kanaka Purandara and The Lamp in the Niche, parts one and two, and this full length Hindi uh, motion picture, the movie Cheluvi, is something which is directly drawn from an oral folk tale. So literature does play a tremendous role in the making of this film. And that is what we are going to look at today. Uh, by way of introduction, I would like to bring to you something about the forests, because Jeluvi ultimately makes us ponder over forests, their existence, uh, their endangered state, so on and so forth. So, as we know, forest loss is one of the major sources of global warming, and it in turn impacts the Earth's weather patterns and results in climate change. It is also common knowledge, and Professor Kerridge has also uh, pointed it out, that carbon can be removed to a remarkable extent from the atmosphere by increasing forest cover because he has spoken about the carbon footprint which each one of us leaves behind. Yet each of us 
<laughs> and this is the point of concern for us. Therefore, my presentation will focus on the context sensitive representation, rather, re presentation of one of the popular Indian folk tales, a flowering tree, in the Hindi movie Cherubi. So, I'll be looking at climate change as far as is necessary for my discussion, the concern with forests, Indian folk tales, the flowering, uh, the tale about the flowering tree itself, its audiovisual adaptations, and Cherubi. So, as far as climate change is concerned, we know that the United Nations has 17 sustainable development goals, which were formulated in 2015. And the target year for reaching these goals, if at all, is 2030. And uh, the 13th goal deals with climate action, and uh, which deals with you know, climate change and its impact. And the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has himself said that climate change is happening now and to all of us. And no country or community is immune. And as is always the case, the poor and vulnerable are the first to suffer and the worst hit. So it is a matter of great concern. And the environmentalist William Ernest McKibben says, among other things, that change, a fundamental change, is our best hope on a planet suddenly and violently out of balance. And this is something which has also been referred to by Professor Gerridge in his keynote address. So the question is, is this change possible? And if possible, how much? And what would be our contribution towards making even the slightest con uh, uh, way uh, to bring this change about? So then, to look at forests, Sustaining the green mantle of the earth is one of the major ways of addressing climate change and its planetary impact because very simple biological knowledge informs us that forests absorb carbon dioxide, particularly during the daytime, to produce oxygen which sustains life. And we also know that Rachel Carson, in Silent Spring, particularly in Chapter 6, which is about the forests, the Earth's green mantle, has expressed that water, soil, and the Earth's green mantle of plants make up the world that supports the animal life of the Earth. Although modern man seldom remembers the fact he could not exist without the plants that harness the sun's energy and manufacture the basic foodstuffs he depends upon for life. Our attitude towards plants is a singularly narrow one because we take them for granted, as she points out, that if we see any immediate utility in a plant, we foster it. If for any reason we find its presence undesirable or merely a matter of indifference, we may condemn it to destruction forthwith. So the existence of a plant depends on the human approach to it as far as the necessity of humans is concerned. As a result, what happens is that, and Carson points out, that we have no choice but to destroy these relationships between the vegetation, which is part of a web of life in which there are intimate and essential relations between plants and the earth, between plants and other plants, and between plants and animals. But she says we should be careful and do it thoughtfully so that what we do may have consequences which are remote in time and place, but which should not affect our lives as has been happening in the recent past in a tremendous way. With this in mind then, let us see what the United Nations is doing or thinking about forest conservation. The United Nations forest instrument focuses on the concern of the member states of the United Nations about continued deforestation and forest degradation, as well as the slow rate of afforestation and forest cover recovery and reforestation, and the resulting adverse impact on economies, the environment, including biological diversity 
and the livelihoods of at least a billion people and their cultural heritage, and emphasizing the need for more effective implementation of sustainable forest management at all levels to address these critical challenges. So the concern is conscious and there is an attempt to do something hands on to counter this concern with the first recession of the forest cover on the planet. The first of these critical challenges is recognizing the impact of climate change on forests and sustainable forest management, as well as the contribution of forests to addressing climate change. And it is here that we will have to now look back among other folk tales at Indian folk tales per se and see how Indian folk tales have been traditionally making us aware of the very close relation between nature and those who live in the natural with the natural, including human beings. So I would say not the relation between nature and humans, but of humans as a part of nature, that is the planetary approach. And for that, I would have to look back at the contribution made by A.K. Ramanujan. And the justification is that it was A.K. Ramanujan who had a tremendous influence on Girish Karnad, facilitating at the end Karnad's making the movie Cheluvi based on one of the folk tales collected by Ramanujan, thus A.K. Ramanujan. Ramanujan had collected and translated from Tamil, Kannada and Telugu, both classical as well as folk literature. The classical literature was in the written form and he translated much of it to English. And these are some of his translations from the classical to English, classical Indian to English for the benefit of his readers because he was eager to bring to the English speaking, English reading world, the valuable literary heritage of India, of ancient India found in the southern part of the subcontinent and this literature which he gathered and translated was specifically focusing on the contribution made by ancient Indian literature towards an understanding of the relevance and value of the environment for the existence of human life in a good way. Apart from that, he had also translated from folk narratives in the oral tradition. And this is one of the early books which contains some of the stories which he had gathered from different parts of Karnataka particularly and some parts of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. This is a book which contains his lectures and essays and these are texts which contain his poems and other essays, all of them contributing towards his interest in the environment. Now he pointed out that oral folk vernacular literature is in, in India is full of variety and sometimes these folk tales also have overlapping similarities. Now because they are in the oral tradition, they have, as we all know, a flexibility which makes them context sensitive about which he speaks in detail in an essay. Now, many of these stories, most of them, at least if we go by statistics, 99% of them are women's tales because it was the onus of the elderly women in a family to take care of the little children, to feed them, to clothe them, and to look after their general health and well-being. 
and handling so many children in a joint family was quite a task. So these ladies used to engage these children's attention by telling them stories. And therefore, the stories were definitely edifying in nature. And the primary focus of these stories, therefore, was about the relation between nature and human beings. And therefore, the stories would be attractive, memorable, and educative at the same time. I shall refer very quickly to a couple of essays by A.K. Ramanujan. One is where mirrors are windows towards an anthology of reflections, where he refers to the plurality of the cultural traditions in India and about context sensitivity, sensitivity and the reflexivity of these oral tales. So they were self-reflexive and they were context sensitive and therefore their flexibility to be uh, appropriate and adequate for any situation is remarkable. And this is exactly what inspires Girish Karnat to adopt a flowering tree for his movie. Therefore, this ability to generate new ways of telling the same story is inherent in these oral tales. In another essay, is there an Indian way of thinking about which I shall not uh, speak in great detail. A.K. Ramanujan draws attention to Indian culture. And apart from referring to context sensitivity once again, he speaks about the frame which forms a context. And we have seen that Girish Kanad, when he adopts some tales collected by A.K. Ramanujan for his plays, uses this structure of framing. So there is a frame story in which you have the main story. But how does Karnad apply the same model in Cheruvi is something which is remarkable. The frame is something which is not as concrete in the movie itself, but the frame is the awareness which he expects in his audience about the endangered environment. So that is how he modifies this frame structuring for the movie Cheruvi. In his A.K. Ramanujan Memorial Lecture delivered on the 21st of March 2012, Karnad says about his friend philosopher guide Guru, surely one of the enduring contributions of his scholarship will be that with others. He drew attention to the importance of women's tales in Indian folklore and culture generally. And this attention was drawn to this collection made by A.K. Ramanujan of folk tales titled A Flowering Tree and Other Oral Tales from India. So we understand from the cover page where you have this painting of a tree as well as the story which gives this collection its name that the story was remarkable and it had a special place in A.K. Ramanujan's uh, collection of folk tales. From here then, we move to the story itself. The story is somewhat like this. There is a poor woman who has two daughters and the younger daughter could shift her shape to that of a flowering tree for which two pitchers of water were required. When one pitcher full of water in which the person who would be pouring the water would not dip his or, hand, uh, his or her nails. This was one of the requirements. This water would be poured on the girl. She would transform to a tree full of fragrant, beautiful flowers. The tree should be taken care of so that no part of the tree is mutilated. And after some time, if the other pitcher full of water was poured on the tree, then the tree would transform back to the girl. So the young girl instructed her sister, the older girl, to pour the pitcher of water on her. She transformed to a tree. The 
elder sister plucked the flowers, made the two girls then made garlands out of these flowers and sold them to make money so that they could help their mother financially. One day they went to the palace to sell these garlands. They were sold. The prince was very, very curious about these flowers because they could not be found in nature uh, as it is. And he followed the two girls and finally he discovered their secret. He wanted to marry the younger girl, so his father consented and the girl became his wife. But then she was forced by her husband to transform to the tree and she did so when this was discovered by her sister-in-law. The sister-in-law in turn forced her to transform to a tree. When she and her friends broke most of the branches in trying to grab the flowers from them and afterwards when they poured the second pitcher of water on her she could never get back to herself as a complete human being. So she was abandoned by them and a traveler rescued her and left her in the precincts of a temple from where her older sister-in-law, the king also had two daughters besides his son, who was already married and she took this half trunk, half girl and kept her among her servants. The prince was absolutely distraught and left in search as Professor Kerridge was mentioning. So this is one journey he undertakes of his lost wife and finally arrives at his older sister's house and he is given shelter there and he is reunited with his maimed wife. He takes her along and she speaks to him, tells him about how he can restore her to her former self and he does so and she becomes a girl once again. The couple is reunited and the story has a so-called happy ending. This is the story which A.K. Ramanujan collects in different forms from various parts of Karnataka and places in his collection. We must note here that the girl is most open to injury when she is most attractive and this is when she is exercising her gift of flowering. So this teaches us that trees are very, very prone to being hurt and harmed by human intervention. So this is a point that is brought home to the little children when they listen to this story. Each time the girl becomes a tree, she therefore begs the one who is pouring the water on her to be careful not to hurt her. After that, it is up to the person who pours the water to take care of the tree, excuse me. Yet, when she is mutilated, the girl cannot do anything about herself. So she can be made whole only by becoming the tree again, becoming vulnerable again, and then trusting whoever it is, in this case her husband, to graft and heal her broken branches. Becoming a tree, therefore, isolates and gives form to her capacity to put forth flowers and fragrance from within, a gift which could make her, number one, extraordinary, but at the same time, number two, very vulnerable. Therefore, A.K. Ramanujan, in another essay on the flowering tree, points out that the story reverberates with our present concerns with ecology and conservation. Each time the younger daughter becomes a tree, she begs the person who is with her to treat it or her gently and not to pluck anything more than the flowers. The warning for not plucking more than what is required is in coherence with sustainable development to know a limit and try not to cross it. There is also the suggestion that a tree is vulnerable to careless handling just like a woman. A tree that has come to flower or fruit should not be cut down because flowering or fruition means propagation of the species, a continuation 
So these are little things which are brought home to the children. And therefore, when they grow up, they actually do so with a full knowledge about the importance of conserving the environment simply for one own sustainability. Therefore, a flowering tree is a typical folk tale with possibilities of different context sensitive endings. And what kinds of endings can we expect? In one narrative, we have it like this. The king was overjoyed at the return of his long lost son and daughter-in-law. After discovering the bitter truth, the king had seven barrels of burning lime poured into a great pit and threw his youngest daughter into it because she was the one who was responsible for not taking care of her sister-in-law, the wife, when she was converted to a tree. All the people who saw this said to themselves, after all, every wrong has its punishment. So this is one ending. In another ending, the young wife puts a condition before her husband when he comes to take her back. And the condition is that the sister, the younger sister, will not be punished because it is for the young wife to bring to the awareness of her sister-in-law that what she has done is not correct and therefore she should try not to do it again. So a possibility of correction of an error is introduced. So we may say that the story has moved a step forward towards developing a sense of awareness among the listeners. That punishment is not the end. There is a possibility of rectification. Now, as we move towards Cheluvi, I would invite you to a quick survey of audiovisual adaptations of a flowering tree. On looking at some of the YouTube uploads, I found to my great amazement and joy that this story, A Flowering Tree, which has been described as a folk tale from India, has been the staple of many animation films, an opera, a dance drama, all of them on the international level beyond the geographical frontiers of India. So they are truly planetary in nature. One is A Flowering Tree, uh, and these are some of the shots I have taken from that story. So it is an animation film and you can see that the older sister is pouring water on the younger sister who has now converted to a flowering tree. There are baskets already there for the flowers to be gathered. And here you have the younger sister turned to a, a lovely flowering tree. In another animation, by Meera Krishnamurti, we have a different mode of narrative and it is somewhat like this, more graphic in nature. And this is how the younger sister has converted into a tree. But we can see that unlike in the previous animation, this image of the younger sister as the trunk of the tree is there. So it is slightly different. Then of course, you have the very, very successful opera by John Adams, which is titled A Flowering Tree. And these are some of the screenshots from that, uh, from the videos of that opera in the YouTube. So it is also very successful. And then of course, the dance drama called The Flowering Tree. So from A Flowering Tree, it has now become the flowering tree until, of course, we turn to Cheluvi. Now, please note the year in which Cheluvi was first uh, screened. It is 1992, which means it is nearly um, 30 years ago. And we'll be happy to see how Girish Karnad was uh, very, very aware of the issues about which we are talking very animatedly today, particularly in this post-COVID situation and uh, how he 
uh, deals with the ending of Chelovi. The first important thing is that the king is no longer there. He has been replaced by the landlord. So now it is the landlord, his two daughters and his son, and a poor woman and her two daughters who comprise the dramatis personae, if you may say so. And it is uh, very interesting that after Kannad passed away in 2019, uh, Ramachandra Guha uh, said this about him. There is no one alive in India who so well understood and embodied the richness and the diversity of Indian culture in his life and in his work and in his writings than Karnad. So Karnad comes from the traditional folk narratives in India and makes them context sensitive for us. Uh, so I would now request you to look at a video clip from Cheruvi and I request Dr. Shomit Maiti to please share screen. Yes, ma'am, I'm trying. Hey, 
पावन का बहुत शौक है ना तुम्हें देखो जानो देखो बेटे मैं जानता हूँ कि इस एक साल में तुमने बहुत कुछ सह लिया है लेकिन मैं एक ऐसा महल बताऊंगा कि तुम सब कुछ भूल जाओगे सारा दर्द और कुमार अरे कुमार few things which i would like to point out uh, here uh, one is that here uh, girish karnad has brought by way of an audio visual uh, some of the things which professor kerridge was referring to that is taking a road and journeying in search of at least that part of the planet where some of this greenery is still retained so this journey then uh in this uh movie is something which is a third uh ending i should say to that folk tale an ending which makes that folk tale so very relevant for our times and this was possible simply because karnad was deeply engaged with the ideas of a k ramanujan which came to him uh from his discussions with ramanujan over time ever since he was a student in the karnataka college in dharna dharwar and uh, ramanujan was a teacher in the uh, lingaraja college in uh, belgaum uh, this story therefore shows how karnad has brought in as i was telling you that invisible frame to this uh, entire folk tale the question about conservation and therefore it makes us return to mckibben's observation that change which is a fundamental change is our best hope but then uh, uh by focusing on karnad's carefully designed ending as i told you in a movie made in 92 standing here today on the 14th of march uh, 2022 i would like to end by going back to the question is this change possible 
the green canopy which Teluvi and her husband go in search of, that is for us to ensure. I, during my travels by rail, have been observing how, by way of development, the trees which had been planted very long ago on the railway platforms to offer shade and shelter, particularly during the hot summer days in India, to the passengers waiting for the trains, were suddenly cut down. The dead trunks, uh, just reminders of their former service uh, for the railways, we can say, and uh, the way in which the Indian railways is also transforming its attitude to these trees. So here is one picture. This is one of the stations on the Hara Kharagpur railway route. And this is what we see, a mutilated trunk with the shed built over it. Here is a development in the uh, uh, sustainable goal of the railways where we find that the shed has been built in such a way so that the tree is kept standing. It is not brought down, for which I thank the Indian Railways. And therefore, what we could anticipate is something like this. This is just beside the foot over bridge in Chhatragati station. And in the evening, you can see the branches full of the birds settling down for their rest at night. Therefore, I don't know. I think we could strike a kind of a balance between um, development and sustainability and try to decrease the momentum of uh, the loss of the green cover of the planet. Uh, on this note, I rest my case. Uh, thank you for your patience. And thank you, Shomit, for uh, taking the trouble of um, uh, showing the video, which I must acknowledge I have received from Girish Karnatji in 2019. Uh, it was a Christmas gift he sent to me, and he told me that it was not in a very good shape. In fact, it is the whole film in a series of clips, and we know that he passed away in 2009 in the middle of the year. So I humbly acknowledge my gratitude. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this brilliant take on Girish Karnar. You know, I had done my MPhil on Girish Karnar and listening to it, I could go back to my MPhil days. And undoubtedly, you know, Girish Karnar's reworking of the myth folk tales, you know, to contextualize it, to comment on the larger social political issues here, uh, deforestation being the case, obviously is, is important. Also, your practical observation regarding deforestation is worth of appreciation. So thank you, ma'am, once again. Thank you. Uh, with that, I now request the participants uh, to, uh, you know, ask questions or they can post their queries in the chat box. Uh, they can also ask Madam questions directly. Yes, somebody seems to have raised a hand. Our MPhil scholar Shopna. Yes, Shopna. Uh, Ma'am, it was uh, like going back to the classes once again. And uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, what I wanted to ask uh, while you are talking about the public spaces and uh, the personal spaces, you have already uh, mentioned about that. It's a, uh, My observation is that the repetition of the unit, that the girl is uh, becoming tree and again from a tree uh, to the woman. And uh, this repetition again and again marks the divisions of the story and um, giving the chronos of um, the time frame. Uh, so what uh, I was uh, thinking about that the spaces in this um, women's centric story um, are marked by the alterations of interior and exterior, the akam and the puram of classical Tamil poetics uh, by alterations of domestic and public space uh, in which um, the action takes place. Uh, I can remember that the uh, woman uh, was transformed and 
uh, with her friends uh, amidst the forest and second inside the bedroom so i was thinking about the role of agency would you like to comment more on that because the agency is more uh, important um, uh, when we discuss about the interior and the exterior spaces in which the uh, uh, roles are important and roles of the women are being always constructed so ma'am please would you like to comment more on that uh yes of course uh, that is a very very important issue uh, particularly in india if i may say so and you are very right about uh, for, let me go step by step uh, in this story which is actually very well structured and uh, that is the oral uh, tale itself uh, the girl undergoes transformation so the girl becoming tree becoming girl this is the pattern and this happens five times in the story in the original story the first and the fifth that is the last time are uh, the only two uh, times that the girl undergoes transformation or shape shifting as uh, we know uh, on her own volition that is by choice the three in the middle are by force she is asked by others to undergo transformation so that is one thing therefore you understand that uh, the girl uh, although she possesses this capacity does not have control over the fact that uh, she may transform to a tree as and when she wants to that goes out of her control this is one fact therefore the interior and the exterior that is the absolute personal knowledge about her extraordinary ability which she possessed then moves to the public domain and thereafter it is impinged upon appropriated and handled by others over whom she has no control and then again you have various dimensions of this so this not having control therefore makes a woman as well as a tree particularly in india prove that they are very vulnerable so that is also there apart from that when you talk about akam and puram poetry which are tamil poetry and which have been uh, translated some of which not all been translated by a k ramanujan as poems of love and war as you can understand how akam and puram become love and war is a very uh, uh, deep rooted thing and girish karnad had uh, delivered the valedictory address at the center for indian languages and literature uh, collaborated uh, conference with the south asian languages center in uh, of the university of chicago and kannada university hampi where he spoke in depth about these akam and puram poems as becoming poems of love and war and how a woman actually these poems are interesting because some of the poets are women and they talk about their own uh, uh, approach to the interior that is their own way of looking at their inner selves the psyche as well as the external world and how the world looks at their way of looking at things so these poems are deceptively short but they are full of information and i must say that these poems by women in the ancient tamil literature are very very indicative of the uh, freedom and uh, the uh, amount of um, uh, uh, the importance that women enjoyed uh, in um, expressing themselves in and through literature in the traditional literature of ancient india is also very significant so these are the different ways i think in which you could take a feminist uh, perspective of uh, akampuram poetry oral folk tales in general and a flowering tree in particular i hope this uh, addresses your query yes ma'am thank you so much yes we can have more questions since we have time in our hands yes uh, said tarika you would like to ask uh, ma'am a question please go ahead no, 
मैम मिथ मिथ एंड फॉक्टेल्स दिस एज ऑफ क्लाइमेट चेंज एंड दिस सॉर्ट ऑफ ट्रिकिस विद द इवेंट्स do you think that myth can myths and folk tales can provide a sort of hope for us because uh, particularly uh, if we speak of amitabh ghosh we have seen in it his fiction in his novels how he employed the myth of bono devi even in uh, the natmesh ka he discussed the myth of uh, gaya i mean in case of mahasada devi he also uh, reinterpreted folk tales to give us sort of hope in this age of climate change so do you think this myths the stories of interactions this multi species coexistence this communications between different forms of life on earth do you think that they can and kannad also uh, does the same thing in in selubi so do you think that this can provide a sort of hope to us in this uh, age of this uh, climate change i personally do uh because um uh you could even say that uh, again i'm focusing on india but it is there in the folk tales of um, all uh, cultures that uh, a very close bond is established between the natural and the human understanding how human beings must acknowledge and must learn the very important fact that they are a part of the make natural which forms the planet and acknowledging this is for the benefit of human beings and transgression of this acknowledgement may result in disaster so what is happening today i feel was something which lurked as a danger in the minds of those who generated these folk tales i don't know how long back but they have emerged from oral narratives and this concern was there at the grassroots level and therefore this concern was passed on from generation to generation in and through these folk tales and these myths and today therefore when that danger which was anticipated by them in a way as a possibility which was a shadow which has become a reality for us today the lessons that were communicated through the folk tales need to be looked at once more with the intention of seeing as to whether they can be accommodated in the way in which we are leading our lives and still progressing in the name of development and that is why actually i have introduced those three pictures from the way in which the railways which is a central government agency is looking at the sustainability of the trees uh in their uh domain okay ma'am thank you so much so for thank dealing you. with the dealing with the present we need to look at the past right <laughs> and i i can uh, name number of indian english uh, fictions on environmental environmental crisis where i see this employment of myths and folk tales just writers have done this to articulate their their i mean understanding of present environmental crisis okay True. from ranging from indra sinha's animals people to ambika sudan mangad swarga to mahasta devi's pterodactyle plants and with the numbers of authors are there who have employed this myths and folk tales just to give us messages about the present environmental crisis so thank you ma'am thank you in fact even neo mythological interpretations uh, are uh, taking uh, this into account and one of the very major aspects of neo mythological interpretations uh, particularly of uh, certain sections of the epics uh, are also taking this into account Okay ma'am thank you Thank you okay Kushbu has a request she wants the PPT to be shared uh, the best way to do is to i think send it to the organizers who can then uh, make them We available. will do the needful ma'am 
we will do the needful at the earliest obviously uh, any more questions okay uh, with that we come to the end of this session thank you ma'am thank you for joining with us and uh, giving us this wonderful presentation we would like to hear you in future also and now uh, may i request uh, mr onunto khara assistant professor and head department of english government general degree college mohanpur poshim medipur west bengal to deliver the vote of thanks for today good evening to all uh, it has been very wonderful and engaging session of the three days international seminar webinar on climate change and its catastrophe uh, organized by shiva bharati mahavidyalay kapgari and mohanpur government college mohanpur i ananta khara on behalf of organizing committee extend my heartfelt gratitude to professor dr devaprasad sahu sahu principal shiva bharati mahavidyalay and to professor dr nimai chand masand for their welcome address and hosting the program i also thank uh, professor richard kerridge for his accepting uh, our invitation and for delivering keynote address at the very onset of the session i convey my thanks to professor jolly das associate professor of vidyasagar university for being with us and for your brilliant um, uh, exploration of the myth and uh climate climatology i also convey my sincere thanks to the convener john convener professor tarik ali and professor sumit kumar maiti and coordinator rik professor rik sarkar who handled the event throughout last but not the least i thank you all participants research scholars and students who are present on this virtual platform to make it a success thank you thank you once again thank you to all uh thank you mr onanto khara uh, for this and uh, before we call it a day let me remind our audience that day 2 will begin tomorrow uh, from 9 am so do join in at time till then take care goodbye have a great day. thank Good you night. so much take care and i wish the webinar every success goodbye Good Good night thank you ma'am thank you thank you